So Joseph Joseph Prince goes on to critique First John chapter one, and he's made his points, which are easily refuted. He just doesn't bother with the context. It is only in chapter 2 of John's first epistle that you see the phrase, my little children, for the first time intimating that from that chapter on, the Apostle Paul, Apostle John, was addressing believers. No, that's not necessarily true. Chapter headings are artificial and may not indicate a change of audience or readership. As a matter of fact, there is no change of readership evident in the, first, in the context as previously stipulated above. In the context of the first chapter, chapter 1, cannot apply to unbelievers or Gnostics because having fellowship with the apostles, God and Jesus Christ is not an option until one becomes a believer. So unbelievers and Gnostics are not in view in chapter 1 at all. Secondly, the phrase, my little children, is not out of place at all. It is obvious who chapter 1 of 1 John is addressing, believers only. And, and there's... And... Um, The phrase rendered my little children is well placed there, affirming. that believers are in view in chapter 1 and ongoing. Also make this blue. No, he's just talking, and then he says, my, my, an endearment. And so in the phrase rendered, my little children is well placed, an endearment describing to whom the first chapter is written to, Believers, affirming that believers are in view in chapter 1 and ongoing. Joseph Prince goes on to say, The Gnostics also believed that they had no sin. So the Apostle John was telling them that if they would acknowledge and confess their sins, God would forgive them and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. They also they had no sin. They don't believe uh, that uh, Jesus came in the flesh. Well, wow. in any case, Bible study manuals comment, since the Gnostics believed that they had no sin, why would John address one chapter, chapter one, one first John chapter one, to them? They are not interested in being told they are accountable to God or anyone, for that matter, for sinful behavior. It is obvious that chapter one is addressed to believers, not Gnostics. Furthermore, believers are not perfect in this temporal life. Hence, 1 John 1 addresses this fact that those believers who claim to have not sinned are not telling the truth. Besides that, you don't get to acknowledge your sins and confess them redundant and receive forgiveness of sins and be cleansed from all unrighteousness unto eternal life. Confession is a work. It is proactive toward that end of forgiveness and therefore cancels out God's grace of forgiveness. You therefore, your reference to 1 John 1 8, which results, reads in the New American Standard, if we believers should say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, is puzzling. Since Gnostics and many unbelievers do not consider that they are accountable to God for any wrongdoing, so what if they say they have no sin? That's what they believe. And since they are not believers in Christ for salvation unto eternal life, they don't even think he came in the flesh, confession will accomplish nothing in the way of forgiveness of sins that they don't believe they have any to confess in the first place. This is nonsensical. So, 
Joseph Prince goes on to say, the early Christians did not have the book of 1 John for some 50 years. So they're getting right with God could not have been through the confession of sins. My answer, why not? Temporal forgiveness of sins through confession has been available for hundreds of years before the first century. Besides that, believers verbally conveyed the doctrines of the New Testament Bible from the beginning when the church age began, which included forgiveness of temporal sins unto fellowship with God in a number of places, including 1 John, of course, and eternal sins unto eternal life, authenticating their oral teaching via miracles. You didn't have to have the thing in writing. A lot of people knew Jesus. Those who knew Jesus told the story of Jesus to others, authenticating it with their sign and wonder gifts. So let's look at the Old Testament period as well. Confess in the Old Testament. He just read this a short while ago. He's got to make this statement. I acknowledge my sin to thee. My iniquity and my iniquity did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And thou just forgive the guilt of my sin. So he, he was in, in jeopardy of losing his salvation, David was. As for fellowship. Which means blessing, deliverance from difficulty. Not that Old Testament saints were saved unto eternal life in the same faith alone in Christ, the Messiah saved, the Hamashiach alone, in the, in the same way. Except that they look forward to the time of the cross, whereas church age believers look back in time. Fellowship with God for Old Testament believers came as a result of confession and practice of various kinds and acts such as stipulated under the Mosaic Law. Take a look at Leviticus 5, 5-6. When anyone is guilty in any of these ways, he must confess in what that he has sinned. And as the penalty for the sin he has committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priests shall make atonement for, for him as for his sin. I don't think that Joseph Prince uh, thought that the Old Testament was a strong suit. Now we have a sacrifice of a goat or a lamb under consideration. Certain Mosaic law provisions provide for that was meant to be a picture of an individual's acknowledgement to God of certain sins committed, which then results in God's forgiveness of those sins, not restoration of eternal life. Leviticus 4, 27-35. Now, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any such things, which the Lord has commanded not to be done, and becomes guilty, becomes aware of his sin, and the sin which he has committed is made known to him, then he shall bring forth his offering, a goat, a female without defect, for the sin which he has committed. <clears throat> and he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. Verse 30, And the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. Then he shall remove all its fat, just as the fat was removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke on the altar for a soothing aroma to the Lord. Thus the priest shall offer it up in smoke on the altar for a soothing aroma to the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. But if he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring it, a female, without defect. He shall lay his hands on the head of the sin offering, slay it for a sin offering, to the place where they slay the burnt offering. And the priest is to take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, 
put it on the horns of the altar, a burnt offering, and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. Then he shall remove all its fat. Just the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice and the peace offerings. And the priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar, on the offerings by fire to the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regard to a sin which he has committed, came aware of, and he shall be forgiven. I don't know why we didn't continue that, except the ASPCA would be after you start killing animals at, at some altar in your backyard. Then you're going to have a turkey, or, I mean, you're going to have a, uh, a lamb stew. Proverbs 28, 13, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find confession. I think I said, but he, he, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Okay, Joseph Prince goes on to say, Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the epistles to the churches, never once taught a on confession of sins. In fact, in his letter to the Corinthian Christians, many of whom were committing sins like visiting temple prostitutes, he didn't tell them to go and confess their sins to get right with God. Rather, he reminded them who they were in Christ. Isn't that the same thing? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Have shame. Our being right with God is not based on the imperfect confession of sins by imperfect men. Yeah, but God perfects it. But on the riches of God's grace and the perfect sacrifice of His Son. Yes, that's true. But whenever you ask man to pray, confess sins, it's going to be imperfect. God in His grace will perfect it. Give you full credit. Those who believe that when John 1 9 is telling believers to confess their sins every time they need they sin, need to realize that every sin needs to be recognized and confessed. Otherwise, based on that verse, one is still not is still unrighteous. So he goes on to say, you cannot pick and choose what to confess, or confess only the sins you remember. That's all God asks. Homologesis. If we say the same thing that God has repeated to you back to him, that's confession. And it's not humanly possible to confess every sin in thought, word, and deed. You don't have to. You went ballistic with that verse and misinterpreted it. The word confess in 1 John 1 9 is the Greek word homologoeo, which means to say the same thing as to agree with. confess our sins, therefore, is to say the same things about our sins as God does. So what's the problem? That it is sin, and that our sins have been for, forgiven and washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation 5, 1, 5, 1, 1 John 1, 7. And then he says, purify you from all unrighteousness, the end of 1 John 1, 9. So when you have sinned and realize you have sinned, true confession is agreeing with God's word and expressing our gratefulness, your gratefulness to him for the reality of your forgiveness in Christ. Now here's what I say in the blue font. Expressing our gratefulness to him, God, for the reality of our forgiveness in Christ is not in this verse. Stop adding the scripture. This verse says confess and we are forgiven of those sins we confess and also purified from all unrighteousness relative to what sins we believers are committing for the moment equals all of the sins that are temporal. Eternal life is not in view. Those sins have already been forgiven relative to eternal life, all of them, past, present, and future. In temporal life, the sins in view in this verse 1 John 1 9 are relative to temporal day and day-to-day -day life for fellowship, not for eternal life. Nowhere in this passage are words that indicate eternal life forgiveness. Done deal the moment you trust in law or in Christ in law. 
Note that the text indicates we believers confess those sins that we are reminded of by God to have committed 